first, um, we have Anna, uh, who's a graduate student in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Um, and she's going to start with a couple slides, but then she's going to actually show you some of the spaces where she works. Um, so we're going to get a little bit of a behind the scenes look into what um, she kind of does every day, which is really cool, I think. Um, and then um, Chantal will go next. Um, she is a research scientist who works in the Yale School of Public Health. It'll be kind of the same thing. She's going to talk to you a little bit about what she does in her science um, and then show you some cool stuff in the lab. Um, so I hope you're really excited. I'm really excited um, to see these. And uh, without further ado, I will hold, hand uh, the floor over to Anna. Okay, hello, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be giving um, a talk here and share uh, with you all some of the research that we work on in the Irish lab. And I'll uh, tell you guys a little bit about how we are working on saving orange juice as one of our projects. So a little bit about me, like um, Rosie introduced, I'm a PhD student in molecular cellular developmental biology and I study plant molecular biology. And this is my, um, lovely helper uh, named Darwin who lives with me. He's a very fluffy cat and I'm from um, this country Ukraine which is all the way over here and I went to school in New Mexico and so where I am now in Connecticut it is very far uh, from home in both directions. All right so plants are really important because they provide a lot of uh, resources for us and can anyone think of um, or type in chat about what we use plants for and why they can be useful. Food, yeah, food is a big one. That's good. Plant-based meat, okay. Oxygen, yeah, the air we breathe, nutrients, medicine. Yeah, these are all really great, um, great contributions. Yeah, so food, obviously a big one. Things like paper, a lot of our medicines, wood, building material. And clothes, the clothes we wear is made up from cotton and that's a plant uh, made um, structure. And so I'm, along with learning about plants, I'm sure some of you may have heard about GMOs or genetically modified organisms. And so what exactly is a GMO? So a GMO is an organism, right? That ha has had its DNA or its genetic material changed in some way through genetic engineering. And usually it's done through genetic engineering. And so an example of this is, so you take the DNA from one organism that has some sort of beneficial trait and you put it into the DNA of another organism. And so that's kind of the idea behind GMO crops. And here on the right is a little cartoon of the GMO crops that we grow in the United States. And these are extremely important in agriculture. Like most of the corn, cotton, soybeans that we grow is um, GMO corn, cotton, et cetera. And so why might we want to genetically modify plants? So does anyone have any ideas as to why it might be useful? There are some images to help guide thoughts. What could genetic engineering or um, more produce? Yeah, more food. Growing plants faster, make them look better. That's a good one. Adjust to different climates. That's a really big one. Make them more nutritious or healthier. Yeah, last longer, yep, yep. Use less resources, yes, that's that's a good one. Oh my gosh, you guys are so great. Right, so I think we touched on all, pretty much almost all of these. Um, so like better yield, more freshness, increasing nutritional value, um, making them more tolerant to things like really high temperatures or really low temperatures. And a big one that we work on in our lab is pest resistance, exactly. Uh, so if we think back to my title about trying to save orange juice, this is why. So citrus breeding disease is caused by a type of bacteria that infects plants. And this affects orange trees, lemon trees, lime trees, almost all types of citrus. And these infected plants make fruit that's really green and really bitter. So no one wants to eat them and farmers can't sell them in the store. And this has really hurt the citrus industry in the United States and also around the world. And so we're trying to work towards a solution to combat this citrus greening disease. And so how can we how can we do this? And so one way is through genome editing, which is what we're trying to do. So say we have 
some traits in a plant that make it a good host for bacteria so it can be infected easily. So what if we change those traits or the DNA of those traits so that the plant is more resistant to the bacteria? That's kind of the idea with behind what we're trying to do, right? So we're gonna cut out or get rid of genes that make plants able to get infected to hopefully make plants um, be resistant and have healthy oranges again. And so we'll do that with one gene, we can do it with another gene and so on and so forth with all the genes that we think that would be really useful. And so I'm gonna walk you through uh, briefly about how we can make genetically edited plants in the lab. And this is, I think, really cool that plants can do this. And hopefully um, you guys can also um, be interested by this. So the first thing that we would do is we would cut up plant leaves. And this example is in tomato, but you would do this with um, whatever type of crop or plant that you have. So you'd cut up little plant leaves and then you would infect those plant leaves with a bacteria called agrobacterium. And so this is a really important bacteria in uh, plant biology because it's how we genetically modify plant cells. So this bacteria takes the takes whatever um, DNA that we want to put inside a plant cell and puts it inside of that plant cell. That's like the way that we can modify the DNA through this bacteria. So the leaves become infected with this and hopefully they're now have some cells that are genetically modified. And then the, um, those little leaf sections form stem cells. And so um, maybe you guys have learned that stem cells can go on to become any type of cell. And so these stem cells start becoming their own little plants. So we start with a little leaf section and now this little leaf section has baby plants growing out of it, which are hopefully then genetically modified. And then they continue to grow and become bigger and then they get even bigger. And then finally, we have a fully grown adult plants that then have whatever genetic modification that we made in them. And so this whole process sometimes takes um, like months in citrus, it takes about eight months to go from uh, cutting up uh, citrus plants to getting an actual genetically modified citrus plant. And it requires a lot of different tools and a lot of different um, um, ways to grow the plants. And I'm really excited because I'll get to you walk you guys around and show um, and show you the spaces that we have to do this. So I'm gonna stop sharing and switch over to my phone. So let's um, go into lab. So here, this is the office. This is where we do a lot of our computer work. And then if we flip around, here is um, the lab space. So there are three labs that work here. And this is where a lot of the molecular biology happens. This is where we you know, make the pieces of DNA and work with the bacteria that we want um, to use. And this is my lab bench. I just finished an experiment here. So it's a little chaotic, but this is our lab space. And then I'm gonna walk you guys down to the, uh, the growth chambers, which is where we grow some of our plants. So, more labs. And these are all plant labs. They all do different plant things. All right. So here is the first row of growth chambers, and I'm going to walk you guys inside one of them. And here's a lot more growth chambers. And so this one, we grow citrus plants in. We actually have multiple of these that we grow citrus in. So here we have a growth chamber. And so we can control how much light the plants are getting. We can control the temperature, the humidity to make the plants grow in the best environment that it could. So this is what a citrus plant looks like. This is a, an orange tree, but a very baby orange tree, as you can see. And there's a couple other citrus species. And then different uh, researchers work on different plants. So this is an Arabidopsis growth chamber, which is dark. I kind of forgot they turned the lights off. Um, and so these are other plants that people grow and they do work on those. And Arabidopsis is a really uh, common plant that we work on. 
And so here is where a lot of the uh, plants that we've genetically modified and are trying to get to grow, that's, this is where they live. So this is my growth, um, little reach-in growth chamber. And here's one of those plants that I showed you in the pictures. It's a genetically transformed tomato plant leaf, plantlet. And so they're just growing. Yeah, little plantlets, exactly. And this one is a citrus uh, reach-in growth chamber. So here we have little citrus stems that we are working on genetically modifying. That's what those all look like. And so this process takes a very long time. And sometimes, oftentimes in citrus, it um, doesn't work or things go wrong. And so it takes many months and often years uh, to get things to, to work. All right, so let's head up to the greenhouse. And so the greenhouse, I try to go up there every day if I can and check on my plants. That's where we keep some of our bigger plants or plants that don't need as specific growth conditions. And it's just easier to keep them up there. So I'm gonna go here. Kind of spooky here. Okay. All right, and here we've entered the greenhouses. Sorry if I'm being a little shaky. I'm trying my best not to not to make you guys too dizzy. Okay. Here is one of our greenhouses. And here, as you can see, these plants would not be able to fit in some of the growth rooms downstairs. So we keep them up here. And then look, there's these are little limes that are growing. It's very fun. And then I work on tomatoes and um, I have some tomatoes growing. And this growth chamber, there they are. These probably look familiar to you all. It's like little baby cherry tomatoes and some other fun plants. Yeah, all right. Um, that's pretty much a very, uh, very short tour of the building. There's greenhouses on both sides of me, so we have plenty of space to grow plants. Um, and I can head back, back to the office. Let's see. And it's very, it's really uh, convenient that we have all of our growth chambers and the greenhouse is so close to us and so close to our labs and our offices. It makes doing research a lot easier. And we just have plants just growing around. <laughs> so. um, okay. This is the hallway of where all the labs are. And now we're back in my office. All right, I'm gonna switch this back. I hope I hope that was fun for everyone to get to see all the all the plants. I'm happy to have any questions. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for showing us all of that. Um, I've never seen inside a greenhouse before, so that was really cool. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Um, I'll start off with what is the most difficult thing about growing genetically modified plants? The most difficult thing is trying to um, have them be genetically modified. I know that sounds very general, but it, it doesn't work every time. So you could infect the plants with these agrobacteria and then the plants don't survive and they or they don't become genetically modified and so it takes a lot of trial and error and some plants are a lot easier to genetically modify than other plants so citrus is really hard to genetically modify um, and it takes a super long time to grow whereas other plants it's a little bit easier and they're more able to be genetically modified just by the nature of the way that the plant is 
Um, what is one of the easier plants to modify? Do you, do you know what the easiest would be? Yeah, um, Arabidopsis, which is, um, I know probably sounds like a foreign word, but it's a type of weed that is probably grown around um, New Haven, but it's a model organism like Drosophila, like fruit flies are in genetics. Um, and it's a plant that is super easy to um, genetically transform or modify. You just dip the flowers in agrobacterium with whatever DNA you want to have edited, and then it, it's edited. And that's very easy. And you don't have to do the all the steps of cutting things and regrowing them. Mm -hmm. That's nice. <laughs> uh, we had a question about um, if you cut off the leaf sections of any plant without dipping it in that or without putting it with the bacteria, would a new plant grow or is the bacteria part of that process? So the way that the plant is able to regenerate is because of the um, the media that it is planted on. So we don't have to put any bacteria with the plant. We can force the plant to make new leaf sections because the media that we put the plant leaves in have certain hormones and certain molecules that um, sort of that, that help the process of making stem cells and making plants. So we, we put them on special media with special chemicals that help them do that. So it's the media itself, it's not the bacteria. And if yeah. you just kind of cut a leaf off some random plant and just had it in your house, like it wouldn't <laughs> regenerate. Right, unless, I mean, people propagate plants and it's kind of a similar process where you can like cut off a plant at a certain point and then you'll get a root or another leaf grown from that part because of um, the molecular chemistry and the hormone balances that goes on, which is uh, a little complicated. Mm -hmm. Um. Wow, we have a lot of questions coming in still. So, uh, so a couple of people asked, why are the lights different in the greenhouse? It looked like it was a different color than the rest of the lab. Yeah, that's um, that's a good point. The, um, the lighting is different in terms of the, like the wave, the wavelengths of light that are being emitted, but it's, it's the same amount of, um, what's a good word? Like the plants are still getting enough photons or like the light, molecules that, that they need to grow. I think that just by nature of the types of lights that we can get that are big enough to cover the greenhouse space is different than the ones that we keep in the growth um, mm -hmm. in the growth chambers, like the walk-in. Okay. Um, have you ever had, I guess, sort of spontaneous mutations occur in your plants that you didn't intend to induce with the with your genetically modifying process? So I personally have not experienced this, but I know that spontaneous mutations happen in nature all the time. We just don't know it. And in research that also happens pretty often, especially, I know some people had, um, I think I saw some other questions about um, trying to induce a mutation, but then it mutates something else that also happens. Um, you have like um, off, off target, like you um, modify something else instead of what you're trying to modify just because that happens sometimes out of chance. Cool. Um, how do you test for the, the citrus greening disease that you were talking about? And are there any sort of aspects of a citrus plant that would make it more um, susceptible or more resilient to that? Yeah, that's a great question. So out in the field, you would see symptoms on the leaves. The leaves start browning and curling. Um, I think how you would uh, test this is you would take a sample from the inside of the, the tree, which is the, the, like the sap section, the, the phloem, which is how the plant carries nutrients. And then you could um, isolate the bacteria and uh, check its DNA and see if that DNA matches with the bacteria's DNA. And then you know that that specifically is what is infecting the uh, citrus trees. And the second part of that question is, we've identified some citrus susceptibility genes. So genes that are related to uh, transporting sugars, um, several plant immune defense genes um, are impacted. And so we're, we're basically looking at taking sections of different genes, like we're gonna get rid of some sugar transporting genes and see if that makes plants uh, more disease resistant. So those are some. Cool. Um, can genetically modified plants cause negative health effects for humans? Is that something? That's, um, that's a very interesting question. I know that um, GMOs get kind of a bad rep in um, today's society. I um, don't 
I don't, not, no literature that I've read has it, it implicated GMOs as having negative side effects. Obviously there's, um, the, the food that we eat, like the genetically modified food that I mentioned in that little slide, a lot of the GMOs go to making like processed foods like corn syrup, or they go on to feed animals and we don't directly consume a lot of that, which I think is part of, part of the reason that people are a little more averse to eating GMOs. But um, from what I know, there are no adverse risk effects to humans eating genetically modified um, foods. That's good to know. Um, can you genetically modify any type of plant? Are there any limitations? There are certainly some plants that are not as um, like amenable to it that are a lot harder to transform. The plants that people, like for example, corn. Corn is a notoriously difficult plant to genetically engineer, uh, but things like tomatoes are a lot easier. So um, I'm sure that there are plants that you can't transform, um, but people don't tend to work with those because <laughs> you can't, there's not much you can do. Um, and to expand on that, can you genetically engineer anything with, <laughs> could you do it with other types of organisms? Um, yeah, so a lot of other research, as, like especially at Yale, they work with different model systems that aren't plants like um, bacteria or fruit flies or zebrafish or mice and people have, um, are able to genetically modify those organisms as well to answer whatever research question that they're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually do work with genetically modified mice, so I know it's possible with them. Yeah, very cool. Um, our last question I'll ask, do you ever eat any of the citrus plants that you grow? So I, I haven't eaten any of them because I've um, not, I've only been here for like two years. And citrus plants, keep in mind, for like a baby citrus plant to producing fruit takes like eight years. Oh, it wow. takes a very long time for them to grow. <laughs> However, we do have some big citrus trees growing in a different greenhouse. And my, um, I think that maybe they, they've tried them. I'm not sure. I wasn't here when that <laughs> happened. <laughs> so theoretically, you could try them. Yes, theoretically, you could. Yeah. And I think the ones that we have are not genetically modified. They're just citrus that we grow just to okay. grow because we're studying citrus. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you. All right. So my name is Chantal Vogels. I'm an associate research scientist at the Yale School of Public Health. And today I'm going to talk about detection and tracking of the SARS coronavirus 2 um, that I'm sure everyone has heard of. Um, but to first say a little bit about myself, um, just like Anna, I'm also from Europe, but I'm from the Netherlands, a small country in the, the northwestern part of Europe. Um, and actually, before the pandemic, I was a medical entomologist. So I study mosquitoes and the viruses that they transmit. So in this picture, you can actually see me here in the back. And all these little dots on the table are mosquitoes that we infected with viruses. And in this case, it was West Nile virus. Um, but then the pandemic hit. And our whole lab just shifted focus from viruses that, that are transmitted by mosquitoes to study the coronavirus. Um, so here you see a coronavirus test. Um, and my question for you is, has any one of you been tested or do you know anyone who has been tested? Yes, I see that a lot of people have. Um, I've been tested myself too, and I think testing is really important to prevent further spread of, of the coronavirus, uh, because if you know that you're infected, you can quarantine and we can make sure that the virus is not transmitted to anyone else. Um, if we look at the swab that, that goes all the way up into your nose, um, there's a lot of different things that are in there, um, and that's what you can see here. And when you um, want to run a test, we want to make sure that we can detect the, the coronavirus that potentially is in there. Um, so what happens is, is two things, really. So in the first step, we try to extract the genetic material. And then in the second step, we use a PCR test to detect the, the virus. And that's, that's happening with two machines that we have in our lab. Um, so in this first step where we try to uh, isolate the genetic material, 
Um, we use Frankie, and this machine is named after Rosalind Franklin, who played a really critical role in the, the structure of DNA. Um, and what this machine really does, so you see here that we have like all these different uh, things present in the swab. So there can be uh, bacteria that are in your nose. There can be um, human DNA, so your own DNA that's present in your cells. Um, and if you're infected with, with the SARS coronavirus, which we abbreviate to SARS-CoV-2, there might also be virus in there. So what this machine really does, it breaks open the virus, breaks open all the bacteria, and we release, um, we release the genetic material that you see here. So then in the next step, we wanna see if we can detect the genetic material of, of the coronavirus. Um, and what happens there is we use a PCR machine. And that's a machine that's really sensitive. So we can detect very small amounts of RNA, the genetic material of the virus. Um, so if we start off with all that extracted genetic material, and at this point, it's still a mix, right? There might be RNA from the SARS coronavirus. There might still be bacterial DNA in there. There's human DNA from yourself in the swab. And in order for the machine to detect just the coronavirus RNA, we need to make a lot of copies because otherwise it won't be able to detect it. So in this machine, it starts copying if there's any, any RNA present and then ultimately it will, um, it will detect and tell us, yes, this, this swab, there is indeed coronavirus present and that means that someone was, was infected. Um, so that tells us, are you infected with the coronavirus or not, but it doesn't tell you which variant you're infected. Um, and there's a different thing that we need to do in order to, to tell which variant you're infected with, and that's sequencing. And sequencing means that we're gonna read the genetic code of the virus. Um, so has anyone heard of any variants that are circulating? They've been on the news a lot lately, especially since this year, there's a lot of different variants that have emerged and they're all named, yes, I see it coming in, Delta, 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 yes. The Delta variant is right now very common. Um, Earlier in the year, we had Alpha as well. It became pretty, pretty common. Um, There's a couple of other ones, but um, right now it's mostly Delta what we're detecting. Um, so if we sequence, it, it's really, really interesting because we can get insight in which variant is, is circulating. Um, so the way that it happened, so let's say this person here is infected with, let's call it virus one, um, and it's spreading it to other people. Um, as someone gets infected, the virus starts making a lot of copies of itself. And in that process, there might be some slight errors that are introduced in the genetic code, and we call that mutations. So once transmission happens, there's little errors that are introduced in the virus. And if we look at this virus here, virus two, we see that a mutation happens where there has been a little error that, that got introduced in the genetic material. And the more that the virus is being transmitted, the more mutations happen. And uh, that's how new variants appear. So due to mutations that, that, for instance, can lead to higher transmissibility, can lead to escape from immunity, uh, we see that there's new variants. And by sequencing, we essentially read the genetic code and then we can say, oh, this was Delta or this was Alpha, this was Beta. Uh, we can tell which variant it is. Um, in order to make sure that we can sequence samples, we need to do a lot of pipetting. And luckily, we have a really cool pipetting robot in our lab. And you see it here in the picture. And we'll, we'll head into the lab very shortly to, to give you a little demo of how it works. Um, so to make sure that we prepare our samples for sequencing, there's a couple of things that we need to do. It's a very complex process, and I'll just break it down in some simple steps. But essentially, the first step is we're going to convert the, the coronavirus RNA into DNA because that's more stable. Then we're going to make lots of copies again so that our machine can, can detect it. And then we're going to add barcodes. And with the barcodes, we will um, essentially allow the sequencer, this big machine here, to read the sample and then give us back the, the genetic code so we can identify which, which virus we're dealing with. Um, and because all these steps require a lot of pipetting, we have this robot here, uh, which makes our lives a lot more easier. Um, and we'll, we'll head into the lab 
to, uh, to show that, but then what we do with the results, so once we get all the sequences back, we can know which, which viruses are. Every week we're posting this on our website, COVID Tracker CT, and we report this to the state of Connecticut. So we do the surveillance for the state. Um, and the way that that looks like is we can, for instance, tell, oh, we found a lot of Delta. Um, we had in the past some Alpha, some other variants here. Uh, and if we look at that over time, we can see that uh, early on we had a lot of alpha, but if you look at like the last weeks, the last months, it's all green. So this means that we pretty much are only detecting delta at the moment. Um, and that is really important to know because we know that delta has a higher transmissibility and then we can, um, can keep an eye on that, make sure that, that we have proper measures in place. So in our lab, we have a lot of people uh, all from different backgrounds, um, and um, I think it's time to head over to the lab. And Mallory, she's a research assistant in our lab. She's our expert who works with the robot every day. So we're gonna meet her and then uh, she's gonna show us how the robot works. Um, so I'm also going to put a mask on. Uh, let's see, stop this. All right. So let's head to the lab. So our lab is not as big as the lab that Adam is showing, but there's some cool stuff happening here. So right now I have Mallory, and then I'll just show very quickly the rest of the lab. So we have the machines that I just showed here. So here is the machine that we call Frankie. And in the back, there's the PCR machines. And then we have a couple more workstations over here. And that's pretty much where all our work is happening. Um, but right now we're gonna go to the star of the tour today. Um, this is our robot here. So I'm gonna put my laptop nice and close so you can really see What's going on there? I think that's about right. And then Mallory is going to show you um, what you can see inside. So inside the robot, let me just tilt this a little bit so you can see the deck. There we go. So the robot has a lot of uh, different pieces of equipment that it uses to move around liquid. So we have um, pipettes here in the back that it can pick up to use to um, move liquid. We have um, the tips in this box back here, which I'll just pick one up. This goes at the end of the pipette. We have um, our plates that we move our samples into and we have little holders. We have a magnetic holder here and just a regular holder back here to keep the plates in place while we're uh, doing our experiments. Uh, back here, we have a section of the deck that is able to change temperature and also uh, vortex anything. So if we needed a sample to be um, mixed up, we would put it back here and it can vibrate and mix up any liquids that are in there. And we have our uh, reservoir rack back here, which uh, we can hold liquids if we wanted to add a certain chemical to our samples. And um, we also have uh, the waste here. So all of the tips that are used or any extra liquid that needs to be taken out of uh, samples can be disposed of here. And so what I'll do now is just run you guys through a quick program so you can see how the robot works. And uh, we'll load up another camera so you guys can uh, see a different angle. All right, so we'll keep one. Um, one camera up close, so that is my laptop. And then we'll just sort of explain what's happening. Um, so it might be good to have actually my camera as the bigger screen. Um, so Mallory just started the run. So now you can see that the robot starts moving. The first thing that it will do is it will scan everything that's on the deck. So we have to make sure that whatever we um, we use the robot for that it's in the right position. If something is missing or if there's something extra in there, it will tell us that something is wrong. Um, and that is to avoid that the robot is gonna hit something or that you know things are gonna go wrong. So first is scanning everything. It's now checking, do we have enough tips? Um, 
So you will see that it's moving around, scanning everything. And really what this machine does is instead of us pipetting everything by hand, we can just have the robot moving liquids around. And that is to make sure that we have uh, samples that we can sequence because there's a lot of steps involved. Um, so now we're scanning our um, reservoir rack that has reagents. So that's the liquid that we're going to move around. Um, and now it's going to check to make sure that all the tools we need are actually in the robot. So it's going to scan them, make sure that we have the right tool. And then once it finds um, the right tool, it will pick it up so that we can actually start transferring liquids. Oh, not enough chips. Should have. <laughs> we did something wrong here. So now the robot is telling us, hey, we don't have enough tips. So let's uh, let's add another box with tips there. So and we have we have multiple programs that we run on the robot. Um, and some some can take like a couple of hours. So we really always have to make sure that everything we need is in there so that the robot can just do its thing um, and finish it. And that's why it's really nice that it always checks us to make sure that we are doing will work correctly. Um, so now we gave it more tips. Um, and now, now we can get started. Okay, so now it's picking up a pipetter and it can actually pipette eight different samples at a time. So it's gonna pick up tips and it's gonna move to the reservoir that has liquid. It will pick up some liquid. It's a little bit hard to see, but it now has liquid in the tips. And then it's going to add it to that red plate that is on the deck. And we can do that multiple times to fill out the whole plate. So we'll pick up more liquid. It's going to go to the plate and add liquid to the plate again. And the nice thing is we can just watch this. We don't have to do anything. So the robot does all the work for us. So instead of us having to pipe out everything by hand, it will just do it all for us. OK. So now we're done adding liquid to the plate. It's gonna get rid of the tips, put it in the waste. And now we're gonna to switch tools. So instead of taking up liquid, we're gonna grab uh, a tool that we call a gripper. And with the gripper, we can move the plate around. So it's gonna pick up the gripper. And then it's gonna go over to the plate to pick it up and in the back we have a mixer and a heating block so if we need to heat up the sample or if we need to mix it very well we can move it to that position where it's placed now and then it will start mixing in a second again it's a little bit hard to see but the plate is being mixed now so that all the liquids that are in there can can mix um, and if we need to, we can, we can heat up the sample. Um, it really depends on which step of the protocol we're at, but we can just literally tell the machine what it has to do and it will do it for us. Um, that will move the plate back. <clears throat> and then now it actually placed the plate on a magnet. So sometimes we use magnetic beads and magnetic beads can bind DNA. Um, and that way we can, for instance, wash our samples. So without losing all the DNA. So we put it on the magnet now, we could do an incubation step there so we can leave it there for a bit. We can add more liquids. Um, and then that's pretty much it. So it's going to scan again to make sure that when we switch between tools that we have the tips where it expects it to be. Um, And then it's gonna take yet another tool. And in this tool, you can just transfer one sample at a time. 
Um, instead of eight, we now do one. So then again, it picks up a tip. It's gonna to, going to get liquid and then add that back into the plate. So now you will see that one by one, it can also add the liquid to each of the positions in the plate. Um, and again, Mallory is the one, like before we had this robot, who had been doing all the pipetting by hand. If we pipette by hand, we use uh, pipettes like this. So you can just hold them yourself. But she had been pipetting like for hours in a day. So a lot of work. So we are all very happy that we have this robot now. Um, which has, has made our work also much quicker. All right, I think that's that's the last step. So let's let's end it there. And then we can see if there's any questions. Um yeah, that was I was just saying that's a really cool robot and I'm very jealous. I wish my lab had a robot. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, we have time for a few questions. Um so you talked about variants a little bit. Um and so we had a couple questions about that. How do you make the distinction? Like how different does the new virus have to be to count as a variant? Um, and then like, what would happen if you actually identified a new variant? Right, so that really depends on like how many mutations it has. Um, and that can be different between different variants. Um, but really what, what people do is when we sequence, we read the entire code. So the whole genetic code of, of the coronavirus is about 30,000 nucleotides. So it's, it's a pretty long genome. Um, and then depending on how many changes there are, we, we say, oh, this is a new variant or not. So it really depends on like how different it is. And that's not like a fixed number. It can change between different variants. Oh, wow, okay. Um, when, so we, I think we had some questions about the franking machine too. So when the franking machine is making copies of all the DNA, it seems like that would just amplify all the DNA. How does that actually make um, the SARS-CoV-2 DNA easier to find? Got it. So Frankie is actually just breaking open the virus and all the bacteria, anything really that's in the sample. And then the PCR machine is making the copies. And we use little pieces of DNA, we call them primers, to specifically target the, the RNA of the, the coronavirus. Um, so if the primers, if those small pieces can bind, we can make a copy. If, there's, if, if someone is not infected, then nothing is going to happen because there's nothing that we can copy. And so it's only the parts of the DNA that correspond to the COVID virus that actually, those are the ones that get amplified, right? Yes, there has to be like an exact match between the little fragments that we put in that reaction in order to get the copies. If there's nothing there or if there's a mismatch, then nothing is happening. And the, the machine will essentially tell us like there's nothing to be detected. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned both RNA and DNA. Could you tell us just like briefly what the difference is between them? Yes, they are sort of different forms of genetic material. Um, so a lot of viruses have genetic material that consists of RNA. Uh, us humans and many other uh, organisms have DNA. Um, DNA is, for instance, double-stranded. I showed it in the little cartoon earlier. RNA is single-stranded. It has different nucleotides. RNA in general is much less stable than DNA as well. So there's a couple of differences, but essentially it it still encaptures like all the 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 genomic uh, traits of an organism. Cool. Um, we're also curious how much the machine costs and um, how long did it take you to learn how to use it? Um, the machine is very expensive. Um, so we do a lot, we use this machine a lot and that's why it's sort of cost effective in the long run. Um, because we, we used to do about, we're actually still doing about 400 samples a week um, we don't do all of that in our lab, but we have collaborators that help us with that. Um, but so really, like we do a lot of sequencing and that really helps us to inform the state of Connecticut about like which variants are circulating. Um, and given that we're, we've been doing this really since, since the start March. of the year, yeah, like earlier this year. And then in the summer we got the robot and that really helped us to scale up. Like if you do this by hand, you can only do so many samples. 
but with a robot, you can just scale up and make it more accessible and, and easy. Awesome. Um, I think we could maybe fit one last question. So um, you guys are handling a lot of samples that could potentially have the coronavirus in them. Um, how do you stay protected from that? Is it possible for these samples to infect you? Yeah, so in the lab where we are right now, we never actually work with the clinical samples. We have a special uh, separate lab laboratory for that, where we have biosafety cabinets, where we can very safely work with the virus. Um, you see that Mallory is already wearing some uh, personal protective equipment, like safety glasses, a lab coat. We normally wear gloves. And when we work in that special lab, we have even more, like we have extra sleeves that go over our lab coat. We have double gloves. We work in a biosafety cabinet, which is essentially you just put your hands in, but there's like airflow to protect ourselves. So there's a lot of measures in place to make sure that we can do that safe. So when we're working out here, it, it's really just after we've converted the actual RNA into DNA, which no longer can infect us and that, which is much safer to work with. Cool, that's good. Um, I think that's all we have time for. So I'm gonna turn it over to whoever's closing us out, but thank you so much.